Amen. Remain standing, if you will, as we read God's Word together out of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we are grateful to be in this place, that we may declare the goodness of your name, that we may declare your faithfulness with our church family. Father, we ask that you will bless this time as we study your word together. May what is spoken in accordance with your word and your will, and Father, may we respond as you would have us to respond. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We'll dismiss children for Children's Church at this time. That's for ages four years old through completed first grade. Four years old through completed first grade. They'll gather right up here in the uh, upper room, in the youth room, and they will be available for pickup after this time together. It is a joy to see you here today. I hope that you've had a good start uh, to your day and enjoyed the little bit of rain that fell. Seems like maybe it was a lot of bit of rain uh, that fell, but it sure was nice to be able to see those prayers answered. I was reading uh, the news a while back, and there is a headline which caught my attention. Obviously, that's the point of a headline, but this one just really threw me off guard. It said, a China man, the wealthiest man in China, has no heir to leave his fortune to. Now he has an heir. He has a son who is 28 years old. But this man, his son, the man's son, does not wish to inherit the man's 32 and a half billion, with a B, dollars. Yeah, wow. That's why the headline caught my attention. This man does not want to receive his father's 32 and a half billion dollar inheritance. Now there's actually a little bit of a trick to it because it's not just about inheritance. Actually what the man doesn't want to receive, what the 28 year old doesn't want to receive is the father's business holdings. He doesn't want to take over the father's company, which involves advertising and hotels and resorts and other things. What the father said is that the son wants to go his own way, that the father wants to make his own business path. You see, the son's focus is not on the same focus as that of the father's. Therefore, the content of the son's life is different than the content of the father's life. Now, this young man is wealthy on his own. By all means, he doesn't want to give up the money. He bought two Apple watches for his dog to wear. The expensive kind, not like the kind I wear, but the over $1,000 a piece kind. And there's a picture of his dog wearing these Apple watches. So, I mean, this, this young man, he does actually like money, and he likes to spend money. What he doesn't want to do is focus on the same things in life which the father focused on. 
In Luke chapter 12, we read a similar type of story, but we actually read it in the reverse, where we are encouraged to let our focus as the children of the living God to be on the kingdom of the Father. As we look in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 22, what we're going to see this morning is that focus determines content, while content directs focus. I'm going to say that again. Focus determines content, and content directs focus. And I'm going to lay this out for you, okay, because this is where the passage is going. And I know sometimes there's a little bit of a pitfall to do, but I think it will help you out as we discuss this text today. Here's where we're going, all right? The focus of one's heart determines the content of one's heart. The content of one's heart directs the focus of one's activity. Now listen to this. God desires to grant us the kingdom. So let your focus be on the kingdom. This is a wonderful passage here in Luke chapter 12. You remember the background. Jesus previously has called out these woes against the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He's warned his disciples against the hypocrites, against the Pharisees and their hypocritical nature. Uh, And he gave this warning about there is something in them that you have to be wary of, and that is the hypocrisy in their lives because it threatens to invade others. And then last week we studied this parable of a man who was Jesus told uh, of a man who had a land that produced great crops. And this man took these crops in and he said, I have nowhere to keep them. So what am I going to do? I have all this wealth. How am I going to use it? And he says, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down what I have. I'll bid, build something new. And then I'll give myself some counsel and advice. I'll say, self, soul, literally, take it easy. Eat, drink, be merry, rest, relax. You remember what the Lord God said to this man? Fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Your soul will be demanded of you. And Jesus says, so it is with anyone who is rich towards himself, but not rich towards God. So Jesus, after having just shared this parable, he picks up on this here in verse 22, where he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, a lot of times we read this passage of Scripture here in 22 and and beyond, and we look at it and we think, well, this is a passage about me. This is a passage about how I need to not be anxious, about how I need to not worry. And that's true to a certain extent. And we take a little bit further and we say, this is a a passage about how I need to not be worried about what I'm going to eat. I'm not going to be worried about what it is that I'm going to wear. And to a certain extent, that is true. But let me present this to you today. This passage is more about God and His characteristics than it is about you and the blessings which you receive from God. This passage is more about God. And there's three truths about God that we find in this passage. The first is that God is aware. He's aware of not just our every need, but He is aware of everything in this creation. Look with me again in verses 22 through 29. It says, Therefore I tell you, Jesus speaking, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. And then He goes on just a little bit further. Verse verse 24, consider the ravens, he says. Reflect upon the ravens. He says it again in verse 27, consider the lilies. So what Jesus is doing is he's telling his disciples, look, of all the things that are important, of all the things which matter in life, I want you first of all to focus on God's creation itself. Think of these ravens. How many of you like ravens? Okay, good. I didn't think anyone really would, but I just wanted to go ahead and ask that question. But they're actually a pretty unique word, a unique bird. It's interesting the way that you look out in the sun, how they look black just all the time, but when you catch them at certain times, you see these different colors begin to be drawn out and pulled out within their feathers. We see these blues and these other hints of other colors, and we see that something which on the surface appears to be rather common and plain is actually part of God's special and wonderful creation. But notice what Jesus says about the ravens. He says, they do not sow, they do not reap, they do not toil in the fields, 
yet they still have food to eat. Their focus is on something else other than planting and raising a harvest. Then Jesus says, look at the lilies. Consider the lilies of the field. Whenever you leave this morning, I want you to look in the, uh, if you go out this way uh, by the nursery, look in the flower bed there, those little orange flowers that are out there. And just take a moment to consider those beautiful flowers. I have no idea who planted them or if they're just volunteer flowers. I, I don't know. They just popped up all of their own accord. But they're beautiful. And Jesus even takes a little bit further. He says, consider the lilies. They neither toil nor spin, yet they're clothed in beauty. In fact, I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was as beautiful as one of these. Think about Solomon for just a moment. The clothing that he had to wear, obviously, it had to have been magnificent. It had to have been a beautiful clothing to look at. He was the king. He was the wisest man in the world. He was the wealthiest king in the world. He was ruling Israel at the height of its power and its influence throughout the world. He had all the money that he needed and then some. And so perhaps he was dressed in silks from the Orient. Perhaps he had different colored dyes placed into his clothing. But think about this for just a moment. It took time for his clothing to be produced. It wasn't as easy as just driving down to, to Walmart or Abercrombie and Fitch or wherever it is, Target, you know. It wasn't as easy, easy as going, that's Target for you folks. It, it's not as easy just going there and saying, oh, that's pretty, I think I'll take that and picking it up and paying for it and then putting it on. No. The material had to be found discovered. It had to be purchased. It had to be transported. And then it had to be woven together, fitted for the king. And then he had to dress in it. Jesus is saying the lilies of the field, they neither toil nor spin. Yet they're more beautiful than Solomon, dressed in his splendor. You see, that's the God whom we serve. He is the God who is aware of all of his creation, of all of our needs, of all of our wants, of all all of our wishes and our desires. He is aware and he provides for our needs. He is aware and he provides. He provides for the ravens, provides for the lilies. He'll provide for you too. But we also read that he is aware. Look with me in verse 22 again. It says, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. A lot of times when we come across this word, therefore, we like to ask the question textually, what's it there for, right? We've said that before. It's a common word in the Greek that's used to show the story is moving on, but it also connects what follows this therefore to what precedes the therefore. But Jesus does this in a very specific way. Luke records it for us in a very unique way. Luke doesn't use just that one word translated as therefore. Instead, in the Greek, he says, therefore, I tell you, because of these things. Literally, it's because of these things I say this. So there's this reference back to what matters. A reference back towards being rich towards God. A reference back towards having in our hearts and in our minds what actually matters in this life. Therefore, because of these things which I've already told you, Jesus says this. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about what you'll eat or what you'll wear. The body isn't about what you'll put on. Then skip down to verse 29. Jesus says, do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. Twice in this passage, Jesus says, do not be anxious, do not be worried. Now, this doesn't mean to live irresponsibly. This doesn't mean to go out and buy whatever it is that I want to buy. It doesn't mean go out and do whatever it is that I want to do. No, it means exactly the opposite. I do need to be a good steward over all that which God has entrusted to me. I need to be sure that I take care of what God has given me, that I look over that which God has given me. But at the same time, I must be certain that my life is not controlled over by the things which God has entrusted to me. including my family. God has entrusted to me a wife. God has entrusted to me children. Maybe God has entrusted to some of you grandchildren. God has entrusted your family not to be ruled by your family, but to be an example for your family. An example and a model of the love of God, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. 
So God provides. God is also aware. God knows that you have needs, but notice this. His desire for you is greater than your perceived needs. God's desire for you is greater than your perceived needs. And here's why we can say that. Because God's desire for you is not to worry about what you're going to eat, not to worry about what you're going to drink, not to worry about what you're going to wear, but to do this instead. Be worried about the kingdom. Be worried about the kingdom. Notice what Jesus says a little bit later on, verse 31. He says, instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Jesus asked this question. It seems like a silly question. It's really a pretty big question. He says, which of you, by worrying, by being anxious, can add an hour to your life? The answer, none of you. None of you has the ability to do that. And then Jesus says, so if you can't control even this little thing. Now, that seems strange to me because being able to add an hour to my life, that seems like a pretty big deal, doesn't it to you? I mean, to be able to say, hey, I have control over this one area. I can control having an extra hour in my life. That seems like a big, important deal. But Jesus says it really isn't. You think it's something big, but in all actuality, it's something very small compared to everything else, compared to what the Father desires to give to you. So don't worry about these things. God knows that you need them. He's aware of your needs. God has shown himself faithful to provide, to meet the needs, not just of his creation, but of his people as well. So trust in God. And I think there's a question a lot of times we ask when we hear a statement like this because we say, now that all sounds fine and good to say, I'm not going to worry about what I'm going to eat. I'm not going to worry about what I'm going to drink. I'm not going to worry about what it is that I'm going to wear. But I know that there have been people who have been living faithfully before the Lord their God and they haven't been able to pay their water bill. They haven't been able to find food for their family. I know that there are missionaries serving overseas who daily fight the struggle of whether or not they will have a meal to eat. I know that there are Christians meeting overseas who struggle every week with whether or not the authorities are going to come in and break up their gathering together for worship. What about those people? What about those people who it appears that God has not met their needs. I like what Howard Marshall says in a commentary about this in verses 28 and 29. He says, This cannot be pressed to mean that man's life is always secured by God. Rather, his uncertainty need not cause anxiety. His uncertainty need not cause anxiety. Hey, those times when it's hard to make ends meet, those times when your relationships are struggling and seem to be on the verge of collapse, those times when you just don't know how it is that God's going to provide, in those times you have a need. God is aware of your need. He is able to meet your need. But should he choose not to meet the need in the timing which you need the need met, don't be anxious. Instead, trust in God. Because he has called us to something so much greater than the meeting of our daily needs. So we learn this text about God as a provider. We learn that God is aware of our needs as well. But we also see this, that even when God seems to temporarily fail to meet our temporary needs, that failure does not lessen God's resolve to satisfy our eternal need. There's coming a day when every one of us here will take our final breath. And we will find ourselves standing before a holy and righteous God. Will you be standing on your own, on your own works, on your own goodness? Or will you be standing covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? That day is coming. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is destined for man to die once, and after that to face judgment. Are you ready? Are you prepared? 
Because the third thing that we see about God is that he is a God of resolve. And I love this. I love this passage here. Look with me in verses 32 through 34, especially at verse 32. It says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Oh, I love that. Fear not little flock. Do you see the compassion in this verse? Do you see how there's this almost shift? It's almost as if Jesus is he just teaching his disciples. And he's teaching something a little bit on the side and, and he's trying to get them to understand something. And then he changes all of a sudden this great compassion wells up inside of him and he says, don't be afraid, little flock. That idea of a flock goes back all the way into the Old Testament where the people of Israel are called, the the people of God, the people of Israel are called a flock before the Lord their God. And it's a picture that's continued not just by Jesus, but throughout the rest of the New Testament where God welcomes into His company those who are here, His. So Jesus says, hey, don't be afraid. Because the Father desires something for you. He desires to give to you the kingdom. How great is that? The kingdom. You see, here it is. It's not just that the Father wants to leave us an inheritance, although we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. It's that the Father wants to leave us His business. He's inviting us to join in in His work. It's a work that we get to be a part of as Christians as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to others, as we are ambassadors for Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We get to be a part of the kingdom of God. It's not just about what I receive. It's about how I get to participate in the business of the Father. And it's God's resolve to let His people participate in his business. Amen? I love that. Let that sink in for just a little bit. This idea of an an invitation to join in. That word translated as resolve, or in, in my translation as the Father's good pleasure, it means to consider something good and therefore worthy of choice. Notice that. The Father has deemed that it is good for us to be involved in his kingdom. And therefore, he is determined, since it is good for us, to grant to us the kingdom. It's like when you find something on the shelves at the store. And you say, it will be good for my son or daughter to have that. So what do you do? You just walk off and leave it there and forget about it. No. You buy it. And then you give it to them. Because you recognize that it can be for their good. And that's what the Father has purchased with His Son, Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross for our sins. You see, the Father is determined, He is resolved to give to His flock His kingdom. And because of that, Jesus says in verse 33 that we can sell and be generous. Look with me there. It says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Because of the truth that the Father desires to give us His kingdom, we can sell and be generous. Like the church in Acts, in Acts chapter 4, when as anyone had need, those in the church with possessions would sell their possessions and then bring the money to the church so it could be distributed to those who were in need. It's exactly what took place in Acts chapter 4. That's exactly what takes place when we have a ministry of benevolence within our own church family, where we give what is needed for the needs of others to be met. Jesus says we can do that because we don't have to be worried about what we're going to eat. We don't have to be worried about always making money off of a transaction. We can give. We can give generously. Because God is meeting our needs, and He's meeting the needs of others through us. He also says this. He says to get rid of these money bags that rot, and instead build for yourselves money bags that are eternal. I know that seems like a strange term, term, money bags, right? That's what we call those wealthy people that are stingy. Well, there goes old money bags, right? I don't know about you, but I've done that. Never, never been called that necessarily. But it's taking something which is temporary and holds my identity, holds money, holds cash for the immediate 
use and uses, has a debit card for something else, it's taking this and it's being willing to take it right over here and it's being willing to set it down and then say, God, take it and use it because it is a part of me. And I want you to take everything about me and use me for your kingdom. And I'm willing to walk away from it. I'm willing to leave it behind so that I can invest my time in what matters most, the kingdom. Making eternal investments. In 1956, there was a group of missionaries trying to reach a people in Ecuador. One of those missionaries was a man named Jim Elliott. And many of you know his name, have heard his story and the story of his missionary companions. But Jim and four of his companions were killed by the very people that they are trying to reach. Recorded in one of Jim's diaries, journals, is a statement, which we've all heard before. It's a statement that's actually very similar to what Matthew Henry, the, the commentator's father, said as well. But Jim recorded in his diary, He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. See, Jesus says we can sell our possessions and not worry. Jesus says that we can get rid of the earthly money bags and we can build eternal money bags. And we can do that because we know that those kingdom investments which we make are investments which will never end. That's wise investing. Look with me at verse 34. Jesus says this, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want you to notice something with me here. That last phrase, there will your heart be also. Notice what is in the present tense here. Where your treasure is. Where your treasure now resides. Then there's a shift in the verbs to a future tense. There will your heart be also. Jesus is not saying that my treasure and my heart are necessarily currently in the same place. He is saying that wherever my heart is focused, wherever my treasure is, rather, that's where my heart will be directed. Notice this. If your treasure are the things of this earth, money, possessions, power, influence, if those things are your treasure your heart is going to be directed towards those things. And when your heart is directed there, your mind is directed there. That's why we said that focus determines content. Content directs focus. What's your treasure? Where's, what's your treasure? And where is your heart being directed? So what do we do with this passage of Scripture? What, what does it really mean in our lives today? There, there's three things that, that it means, and I, I encourage you, challenge you to write these down if you haven't been taking notes. First, how should we apply this to our lives? Simply this, believe a kingdom which will never pass away exists. Believe that a kingdom which will never pass away exists. If you do not believe that there is a God in heaven, if you do not believe that there is a creator of all things, if you do not believe that there is a good and loving God who sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of mankind, if you do not believe that there is an eternal place where you will worship the one who is seated upon the throne, then you have absolutely no reason to make kingdom investments. That's where it starts. Believe. Hebrews chapter 11 Verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Do you notice the starting point? It's belief. If you don't believe a kingdom which will never pass away exists, then by all means continue to treasure the things of this earth. Second application for us is this. Confess that to seek after material goods is to live like the world. Now, I know that's not a very popular statement, but it needs to be confessed. 
To seek after worldly things, to seek after material goods, is to live like the world. Listen, who is worried about the world? The world is. The world is worried about the things which are temporary. The world is worried about money and wealth and power, influence, all these things. Who's worried about the kingdom? It's not the world. Why would the world worry about the kingdom? They don't even believe the kingdom exists. Or if they do think the kingdom exists, it's not important enough for them to change their lives, to give up the things of this world, to make kingdom investments. Listen, Christians, if you are living a life that seeks after the things of this world, then you are living exactly the type of life that Satan wants you to live. A life that is separated from the will of God. Because what's the Father's good desire? To give us the kingdom. To give us the kingdom. Now listen, I, I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with providing for your family, with making investments for retirement or any of those other things. I simply want to ask this question. Are you living life concerned about the kingdom? Let the world worry about the world. Christians should worry about the kingdom. And finally, this, accept what God has determined to grant us. Accept what God has determined to grant us. Treasure the right thing. And you might say, well, how do I make kingdom investments? What does that really look like? Well, here's a few examples. It looks like discipleship. Doing what Jesus told us to do. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. Discipleship is a kingdom investment. When I meet with someone weekly, that is a kingdom investment. When I send out a text to a group of men of, with whom I'm accountable, that is a kingdom investment. When I ask someone else, not just this base conversation of how's your week, how's your weekend, was it good, I hope it was. Instead of doing that, when I ask the question, how's your walk with the Lord? Are you spending time in God's Word? That's a kingdom investment because it's laying aside the temporary, focusing on the eternal. And I can be focused on the eternal because I treasure the eternal in my heart. It looks like serving in the church, outside of the church. It looks like serving for the glory of God. It looks like evangelizing, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, telling others that there is a God in heaven who sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins. And it looks like giving of time, of talents, and possessions, all to be used for the furthering of the kingdom of God. Listen, if your focus is continually on you, what you want, what you like, then as we've already said, Satan will keep you right where he wants you, apart from the will of God. God's desire is to give you the kingdom. So don't be afraid. Trust in him. If your heart is focused on the kingdom, then the kingdom will be in your heart. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we thank you for your love. And Father, perhaps some of us here today need to be challenged, and we need to be encouraged, because we have become convicted that our focus is on earthly things. So on things over which we feel that we have control over, thing, it's on things which we feel we can influence. Father, if our focus is on worldly things, then please convict us. And God, redirect our focus. Father, may we treasure that which you desire to give us, your kingdom. And thank you, God, that you desire not just to give us an inheritance, but God, you have invited us to be a part of of your business. Father, please teach us to treasure the right thing. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.